All right, we'll get started. Welcome, and thank you for joining us for our event this afternoon that we are calling CESA, Collaborating for Racial Equity and Disability Justice. This is Emily Blum speaking, and I'm the Executive Director of Disability Lead. My pronouns are she, her, and an image description of me is that I am a white woman with brown wavy hair. I'm wearing tortoiseshell glasses and a cream top and an animal print sweater. In my virtual background appears the Disability Lead logo, which is a one-lined typeface made up of text that reads Disability Lead. And the T in disability is a plus sign made up with our three distinct colors, orange, fuchsia, and purple, all coming together. The plus sign symbolizes the positive impact that people with disabilities have in leadership roles and the importance of intersectional perspectives coming together as one. Also included in the virtual background is a pattern of disruption, which symbolizes our amazing network of positive disruptors. All people with disabilities who are using our power to create an equitable and inclusive society. To learn more about our work, who we are, what we believe and what we do, please visit disabilitylead.org. We are so excited to share our work and our stories with you. We sent out a guide on accessing key accessibility features in Zoom and we have CART ASL interpreters, and I think we're pretty close to having Spanish translation available today. Our translator is just a little bit late. Um, if you have any challenges accessing these features, please connect with us via the chat box. My colleagues will be monitoring and responding. Finally, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon, including so many Disability Lead members and those who donated to support the accessibility of this program. So on to the program. The Community Emergency Services and Support Act, otherwise known as CESA, is a landmark bill, bill made possible by the leadership of Access Living in partnership with many organizations and individuals, including racial justice advocates. Following the horrific shooting of Stefan Watts by a police officer, the Watts family, Access Living, and many partner organizations wanted to create an, an alternative to police responding to mental health crises. As we all know, police response too often results in disproportionate arrest, violence, and killings of black and brown people with disabilities. But because of this collaboration and seven years worth of work, this new law, which must be implemented by July 2022, now mandates that Illinoisans will receive services for mental health professionals instead of police. As this new law demonstrates, when we approach systemic oppressions collaboratively, we stand to make a change. It's why Disability Lead launched our newest initiative that we are calling the Collab. Our goal through this community is to forge lasting and strong partnerships across social justice issues. We invite you to visit disabilitylead.org backslash collab to learn more. Joining us today is the Honorable Robert Peters, uh, Candace Coleman from Access Living, and Cheryl Miller from STOP, Southside, come, Southside Together Organizing for Power, who will discuss CESA cross social justice partnerships and where we go from here. But we begin with Stefan's sister, Renee Watts, who will talk about her brother and why this new law is so needed. Welcome, Renee. Thank you for that wonderful intro. Uh, my name is Renee Watts. My pronouns are she and her. I am a black woman with black hair. I have a gold shirt with black stripes and I'm wearing glasses in my background. I have some purple LED lights that I like to have on. And let's begin. So I am the sister of Stefan Edward Watts. Stefan was a loving computer nerd. He loved talking to anyone who would listen about computer games, philosophy, and he loved having discussions about the Bible. When Stefan was a toddler, he began to miss milestones, like uh, he physically looked normal, but wouldn't look you in the eye, had trouble communicating verbally, and he was very sensitive to noise. Around the age of eight, he was diagnosed with having autism. We were told by his doctors, social workers, at schools, uh, during IEP meetings, to have him transported to Streamwood Hospital when Stefan was in crisis. We were not allowed to bring him on our own per the Illinois All Kids Insurance at the time. He had to be brought by ambulance. The ambulance would not come without the police. February 1st, 2012, my father called Calumet City Police non-emergency number. He said he needed help bringing his son to Streamwood Hospital. Instead of getting officers with compassion, life experience, or patience, 
My father was met with two overworked, stressed out, hostile police officers who were tired of dealing with Stefan. In the aftermath of the shooting, the police chief of Cayman City said that Stefan had made poor decisions. In the first step to creating change, understanding the problem is a major component. Three major reasons why I believe Stefan was shot were because of class, race, and his disability. Our society, our society, society is hardwired to classify people and treat them based upon these classifications. When our parents were looking for resources to help Stefan, we were met with resistance because Stefan didn't look like he had a disability. It was clear that the schools treated him as a child with behavior issues instead of a child uh, with autism. The police told us they were trained to handle persons with uh, persons on the autism spectrum. However, the training was inadequate in addressing the significant social, communicative, and behavioral manifestations that came with his disability. The data showed at the time that autism spectrum disorders were on the rise, affecting one in 88 children, and the likelihood of a first responder encountering a person with a disability increases as the number of persons affected increases. During that time, governor, the then governor, Pat Quinn, and the then mayor, Rob Emanuel, planned to close 12 mental health facilities statewide. And there's a strength in numbers. I volunteered since I was in high school, and I understood that when the Black community is successful in creating change, it not only benefits the Black community, it benefits other minority and majority groups. I also find this to be true with the disability community. When they make noise and they're successful in change, it benefits everyone. In the days and the months after Stefan's murder, we were approached by several individuals and organizations wanting to help in any way. Some were very helpful. Some were just trying to attach themselves to us for their own agenda. But I was very gratefully introduced to Candace Coleman with Access Living at AYLP years after. During the AYLP meetings at Access Living, I learned many things about the disability community I did not know before. When I would talk about this, the times we had to call the police for help, I would describe it incorrectly, using terms like he was acting out or he was having an episode, instead of using the word crisis. This was not the way that the disability community wanted to describe it. So because I was in a safe, a safe space for people with varying disabilities, they were able to share their stories, their ideas, emotions, and beliefs, and I was educated. I was there as a respectful ally, and it made me even more invested in the work that we were doing. Discussions about the bill were hosted at Access Living and was created and led by people from the disability community. I believe this is why the bill was so successful, because it truly came from the community it was meant to serve. We as a family felt that we can trust them with Stefan's story in a way that would honor him and help others. Our family experienced a very traumatic event with the loss of Stefan. We knew Stefan's death would not be in vain. We knew that the community would rise and demand change. We thought about what was lacking in our public servants and delivered at SESA. And this is what happens when you collaborate and involve, uh, involve the people you are trying to help. Many thanks, and to you, Candace. Thank you, Renee. Um, I must say, as a community organizer, um, I often think um, that we are the gatherer of people um, who have the power to make change, but also gather people who have lived experience to speak to the things that we want to change. Um, hi, again, my name is Candace Coleman. Um, my description, I'm a black woman um, with short hair. I have a long face um, and a purple top. I'm usually smiling um, big. Um, in my background, I actually have a photo of the artwork uh, that contributed to the SESA campaign. Um, in that photo, you will see the words Community Emergency Supports Act um, in pink. Um, and on the background, uh, there's uh, watercolors of blue and green and yellow and a little bit of tan. Um, and in the forefront, there is a park bench with two people sitting there having a conversation. Um, that's actually a photo of two of our members of AYLP. Um, imagining what a uh, crisis response would actually look like uh, when people are met where they're at instead of being forced into a setting that they don't want to be in. 
Um, that being said, I'm really excited to be here with Disability Lead um, as a member, but also as a fellow from 2020. Um, and I want to give honor to advance your leadership power because any of this wouldn't happen without their push to keep moving forward and to keep believing that we could um, see the world that we believe we want to live in and actually make that change. And so um, that being said, uh, the CESA Act or well, the CESA law does uh, three things. Um, one of the things that it does is that it mandates that 988 and 911 actually collaborate. Um, in the near future, um, there will there is an extension of the suicide hotline um, known as 988 that will be facilitated in Illinois. Um, and because of that, they'll be able to offer um, mobile uh, crisis units um, in various areas. They'll also be able to dispatch any services or supports uh, that are available um, in Illinois, all under one umbrella. Um, and so what SESA does is it mandates that they coordinate with 911 because we don't want anyone to fall in the cracks who will need that support. The second thing that the SESA um, law does is that it asks that when records are being taken for those crisis calls, it extends the definition of mental health uh, category of people to other categories of disability types because we know um, that folks who are neurodivergent, folks who have behavioral health, folks who may have um, used substances and just other types of people may be using the services supports. And so we wanna make sure that that data is collected accurately so that services and supports can get the right funding um, and be able to be pinpointed um, across the state of Illinois um, so we can expand those services and supports. The third thing that it does is that it mandates that we create uh, 12 uh, emergency response committees that include everyone who's a part of the emergency response teams to actually have a, a mapped out plan for when people have mental and behavioral health crises. Um, that includes folks with lived experience, uh, those who are part of the emergency uh, support teams, as well as those organizations um, and supports that provide those services. Because what we learned in this seven years is that information related to when folks are in crisis is such a fragmented uh, idea and people just don't know where to go or who's doing what. And so we wanna make sure that we provide uh, well-rounded services and support so it's not a guessing game and so that we don't have to rely solely on um, police response uh, to be the response when folks are in crisis. That being said, um, AYLP uh, did a, a few things, uh, actually a lot of things in the last seven years to make sure that we were well-equipped uh, to launch the CESA law. A uh, few things that we did was we had a series of listening sessions um, across town, uh, both on the south and the west side, as well as, as Renee said, we met at Access Living to hear from people who had experience with going through crisis, what led them to that crisis and what actually happened and allowed them to talk about what, what type of service would they rather have instead of police uh, showing up. So we had those conversations over the last years. The other things that require us uh, to really dig deep is when we first uh, decided that we wanted to do this law, um, what connected us to the Stephon Watts family was actually a member of our group, Chris Watts. He was, uh, he was a member of our group and he told us that his cousin had this experience and that his family um, really wanted to do some things. And so he was able to connect us. Uh, during that time, it was around uh, the emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement. So we were noticing that a lot of, of victims of violence were people with disabilities, but their disability stories were not told in those situations. And as Renee mentioned, the closures of the mental health clinics around the city of Chicago. Um, and so AYLP decided that they did not want to continue to count statistics or count um, uh, folks who were dying, but that we wanted to help people who can live and, and to um, get what they needed, but still be able to be in the community. Um, and so what that required was for us to reach out to various 
entities and people to uh, create a law. And that's how we actually got met up with Senator Peters. Um, and then in order to pass legislation of this caliber or to move anything in social justice work, you have to be able to collaborate in coalition with other people. Um, and so the intersectionality of race, disability, mental health led us to people like Cheryl at STOP. Um, and she'll talk a little bit about her organization as well. So I'm going to yield the floor to Senator Peters and to Cheryl. And I'm going to start with Senator Peters. Can you talk a little bit about how uh, we met and what actually made you uh, get involved with uh, this legislation? Yes. Um, so I'm Senator Robert Peters. Um, I'm a black man uh, in a uh, maroon or burgundy shirt. I mean, jacket with a white shirt uh, in a background that has uh, some picture frames um, and a nice new haircut. I should add that. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I met Candace in Access Living um, wow, a few years ago. Um, we had a, uh, I think it was like a briefing, sort of get to know each other uh, conversation uh, to talk about um, the disability justice uh, and power movement. Um, and it led to a conversation and I, I might be melding the two meetings together, but it led to a conversation um, about what was originally the Stefan Watts Act uh, and became um, CESA. And I remember um, hearing about it. And, you know, oftentimes um, we hear folks, especially in the mental health space, they use that as a talking point, not an action. And it felt like uh, something that was perfect to take up as an action. And uh, listening to um, everyone in that space, uh, in AYLP, um, and hearing that this is going to be an operation that's going to really be about uh, both the inside and outside game in an authentic manner um, drove me uh, to, you know, saying I would like to sponsor as a as in the Senate. Um, but very clear, like that's not my role is the organizer under the dome. Um, uh, but this is in a collective uh, coalition with organizing that happens in a variety of spaces uh, and it was just a clear partnership and I was very honored and uh, appreciated being thought of um, as a relatively at then and I guess still now a new state senator to carry uh, this piece of legislation. Thank you Senator Peters. Uh, Cheryl. Do you want to talk about um, how we met as a coalition partner? Yes, thank you, um, Candace. I my name is um, Cheryl Miller, and my pronouns are she, her, um, and I'm from Stop, and I'm a black woman with maroon glasses and um, uh, spiky natural hair and a pink. Uh, two tops, a pink top underneath and a, uh, a over top with um, black with black background and um, pink and green flowers. And I um, actually met, met because um, I'm a part, in addition to being a part of STOP and also part of the um, uh, <laughs> Collaborative for Community Wellness. And, um, and the, the purpose of the Collaborative for Community Wellness is uh, a coalition of 70 organizations that have been advocating for the reopening of the mental health clinics and the expansion of the public sector uh, um, clinics and also um, for a, non, a citywide non-police crisis response. And um, people, or at I, oh, and I joined STOP a year ago, but this cause of reopening the clinics has really been on my heart for a while. Um, I, um, uh, uh, many years ago, I knew someone who was a clinician in one of the clinics and 
they uh, he kept getting moved because as this clinic got closed and the next clinic got closed and and also I knew from talking to him just how much it mattered um, that the public clinics mattered um, and and he said that one of the things is that people didn't understand that in addition it, clinicians were were also in addition to um, therapy helping people um, manage their lives because often people did not have other types of support. So closing the clinics was really, really a problem. So I was very grateful when I got the job at STOP that I could actually have as my primary campaign as the public health organizer, um, the treatment not trauma is my primary, and treatment not trauma is the opening of the clinics, expansion of the clinics citywide, um, and the uh, creation of a citywide non-police crisis response for mental and behavioral health. And um, and I was had been urged to go to a, a meeting at Access Living, and and I I'm, I'm not sure how I finally ended up going to one. I don't know if you sent me. Um, an invite or if Arturo sent me an invite. Uh, oh, and Arturo, Dr. Arturo Carrillo is the um, co, he and I are co-leads for the collaborative for um, community wellness. And and I was like, Sasa, what is that? <laughs> and then I realized, oh my goodness, this is everything. And, um, and, and I have to say my favorite meetings that I go to are the um, CESA meetings because everybody, it's just, it's just very enjoyable. So there's a little party in every meeting with laughter. Thanks, so. Cheryl. Um, so Senator Peters and Cheryl, we all have been organizers at trade. Um, CESA looked different for different people because of our audience. Senator Peter, as a legislator, what are some ways that you think you were able to raise awareness about um, elements of SESA, um, as you said, under the dome? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so I think first there's gotta be a lot of credit to um, you, Candace and Cheryl and to the folks who actually organized in what has been, you know, at least in the, the relative short term, I'm saying this, in a broad manner, a decade of really powerful organizing around mental health justice. And so in terms of, you know, when we think about the conversation around almost anything, we hear uh, mental health brought up. So, you know, when you hear about violence, you hear about mental health. Um, when we talk about um, the stresses uh, that currently exist in this economic environment, we hear about mental health. That happened because of organizing, uh, that it became actually part of a broader conversation. Uh, and I think that sort of opened the door um, to in Springfield where, um, and it, actually let me back up, it opened the door for the federal government um, to push and create 988. And once that happened, because of the organizing, because of what happened to the federal government, um, for me as a, you know, and I, I, I'm, an, I'm an organizer through and through. Like, I don't, like, I believe in the value of like a roll call, which is number 30, 60, and one. So 30 in the Senate, 60 in the House. And one signature is very much like an organizing thing. You have to build, build the base to get it done. Um, but we were able to have those opportunities because of the work that led there. And then, you, when you're doing the roll call, it's knowing that you have conversations that those conversations that I can have, but there's conversations that um, the coalition can have, um, you know, like you all at Access Living with folks um, that find out where they're at, what are their hot and cold points uh, and where you can have that conversation. And then it's also taking advantage of a moment. Uh, and I have to be honest about that. And we had a combination of things. The federal government um, opening up that opportunity for 988 uh, means that there is going to be funding and a system in place uh, that we can build off of. 
the um, the painful tragedies that came out of 2020 on countless murders of Black lives at the hands of police opened up a you know a conversation, an opportunity to to change, to fundamentally change our public safety system. And I think that it, for a good period of time, we had a chance to really do transformative pieces of work. And I think the other part about this is to make it clear that we're talking about public safety. This is it all, this is always about public safety. You know, when we think about Stefan um, and we think about, um, you know, here in my backyard, Charles Thomas, uh, the student who got um, shot, like when people are going through trauma, when they're going through a crisis, they should be treated and lifted up in that crisis. And at the end of the day, if the argument is, what's going to give them the safest experience? What's going to lead to safety? Well, the per people who are trained, uh, people who've done the work in terms of mental and behavioral health should be the people who treat it. And I think people understood that. And if you combine all of that and you know you combine the conversations I've had with people, we were able to create a bill that if, you know, two years ago, if you told me this bill would have been bipartisan, I'd have been like, that's going to be a lot of, lot of, lot of work, right? And like, just, it would have been a huge, uh, steep hill. Um, but we actually passed a bipartisan bill uh, in both the Senate and the House. And because of the, you know, combination of the organizing, the moment, uh, and the, you know, the, 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 uh, the roll calling, uh, Illinois became, you, you know, this year, the first state in the country to do so. And I honestly, I will say, um, for some people, I think that was something that they know people who are generally, and, and we should go into this because I think Candace, you, you, we talked about this before we did this is the framing on health, um, reframing this conversation from, uh, it's not just quote unquote criminal justice reform but it's about healthcare. And I think that's just an important part and a conversation and maybe for another town hall about how I fundamentally don't believe that I'm doing work that's criminal justice reform. I'm doing work that's about broader uh, public safety policy and reframing this conversation about what it means to have safety in this world. Thank you, Senator Peters, um, for saying that. I want to say in addition to the public safety conversation um we have to imagine what community looks like and oftentimes when we're talking about public safety we're not imagining that in community there are people with disabilities various types of disabilities um who are people of color who need services and supports that public safety can create um and i want to say that when you mentioned um all of the things that we experienced in 2020, um, I believe that what allowed us to actually reach the legislators was access through Zoom. It allowed us to be in more rooms uh, to actually talk to legislators, to meet with their constituents um, and to have those conversations um, so that we could uh, convince them that this was a, a something that they can get behind. And so um, one of the tools that we used prior to COVID was that we would uh, take a bunch of people down to Springfield and do in office visits and try to meet you at the rail. But what COVID afforded us was the opportunity to meet one-on-one -on -one with folks, you know, in their homes or in their offices um, to actually have some very candid conversations because a lot of times as, um, we as people, we get really nervous about talking to people like you <laughs> um, because we usually don't see that y'all are people too. And so um, in this pandemic, we were able to really relate and connect with people um, on a level that I don't think we would have been able to if we were not in a pandemic. Um, also, what you mentioned was, um, you know, the murders of various people um, getting harmed by police. Um, taking action uh, literally meant uh, look different um, virtually. And so we did a lot of um, um, virtual uh, actions, but also people had to take to the streets um, as a way to showcase that what we were dealing with, we were not going to take it anymore. And so 
Cheryl, if you could talk a little bit about um, in your experience, uh, what that on the streets, um, what activities did you have to organize uh, to make people understand not only about SESA, but like in our city, um, what people were going through? Well, um, to, go, to go back a little bit in um, the history of stops, um, stop got involved in the fight for, and I really like that term, um, Senator Peters, and I'm going to use this from now on, mental health justice, um, because um, we realized that the stop had already been fighting displacement um, in the Woodlawn community. And um, when the clinics were being closed, uh, one of the residents who's who had his building had been successfully um, the displacement from his building had been successfully saved, but his clinic was closing, and he said he still needed to move. So um, stop realized that dis displacement looks like a lot of things um, when you disinvest in neighborhoods and in community communities of color and in community in working class and in poor communities there's a that's what displacement also looks like and so one of the there were a number of actions that um stop members took and um to keep to in at first with daily we're able to keep some clinics open um and 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 you know went to the streets and went to city hall um and then with Rahm Emanuel who um did not have any allegiance to communities um and close um uh, the mental health centers and schools regardless of what communities said that um they wanted um after the Woodlawn clinic was closed um there were a number of people who included clinicians and um, clients and people with lived experience who literally occupied the Woodlawn Clinic. They said, okay, um, and it was, you know, it was very clever how they were able to do it and to get in and to barricade themselves inside the clinic and, and, and remain. Um, and um, after during that occupation, when when people did were finally moved out of the clinic itself, people occupied the space in the street and um, the lot across the street for for months. Um, and there, so in in that and so in that time since those um, closures, there have been. A number of street actions um, and a number of different types of direct of, of direct actions. We'll say direct actions. Um, since I've been there, we did we've done a, we've taken to the street as um, for uh, we did um, a very successful rally. Um, we meaning stop the collaborative for community wellness and um, allies and partners of uh, partnerships. Um, we've uh, did went back to the Woodlawn Clinic in the spring on the anniversary of the closures um, to say, to, this is not right. These are, this is still closed. Um, and although there were, there is, uh, there's the public, centers are still closed and they are very, very important. And then, and more recently, and we've had um, a number of rallies, more recently we had um, a vigil that um, many, many um, coalition partners came to, including Access Living um, is there and, um, and partners who've been um, fighting around the, the, to make sure that the city budget um, looks like what it needs to for community people um, and not for corporations and um, excessive policing. 
so um so i did i answer the question <laughs> yeah i just want you to touch a little bit on based off of the actions that we've collaborated on um in the communities what would you say is the greatest need um that can align with why uh, such an act as SESA exists? Uh, I think that, um, I, it, well, the, the greatest need and, um, and I think the reasons for um, the actions are to, so that people can see that there is still a fight happening. Um, and so that they are not people because there's a lot of discouragement around around this because it's been so long and people have people have been there's been real life suffering happening for many years. So I I think that the greatest need is to have, um, you know, in terms of, um, of the public health sector that we need to have a a public city mental health center in every single ward and um and part of it that that we because we also feel that we want um as as sessa is implemented and uh, uh, we want people we want those clinicians mm -hmm. to come out of the public sector so that people can then you know to have the triage centers to be um the the public clinic so that people are then able to be put triaged into services that are sustainable, that are in their community um, and that are free um, and which includes um, free medicines and also so that people can um, also walk themselves if necessary to someplace, then there's some place to go. And I think that that need, um, someone in the Q&A wanted to know about the disparities of um, clinicians and um, the uh, collaborative uh, CCW has um, did a survey that showed that, uh, or study, I guess, that showed that um, in the wealthiest communities in Chicago, um, there was an average of four point I think it was 4.2 or 4.3 clinicians per thousand people in um, in the most in the in but for the majority of Chicago um, and and especially for Black and Brown communities and economically divested communities there was uh, two tenths of a clinician it averaged two tenths of a clinician per thousand people so. So that is clearly inequitable, and and that's why we need to have these these centers. Thank you, Cheryl. I want to say that um, a, a few things um, Sessa wanted to accomplish. So we know that Sessa is not the end all be all. There are a lot of steps that are required to um, to make this happen. Um, one of the things I want to make sure that we end with is some key things that we've learned from each other. Um, and then how can people, well, I could talk about how people can actually support um, this effort. Cause there are a lot of questions with key things like how can we train mental health professionals outside of these institutions? Um, and I know the question that we wanted to answer with Sessa is how can um, emergency responders, people with lived experience, any service providers can actually coordinate. Um, and so I wanna talk about that a little bit, but before we get to that, uh, from you all's opinions, uh, what are some lessons that you think were learned um, in this process in the last seven years? Or what are some I always the ways? I'm, gonna let, I'm gonna let Cheryl actually go first and I'll go second. I, I, um, I think the some of the lessons that I've learned in this process since I've been involved is absolutely the necessity for um, for coalition and and reaching out and um, and I think um, really centering the conversation um, 
and, and really helping other people realize that we're talking about health. Uh, and there's a lot of mythology around people with mental illness. And, and you know, it's like, oh, they're, they're crazy and they're violent and they're dangerous. And, you know, those are the worst calls to go on because, you know, you don't know what's gonna happen and blah, 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 blah. Um, and, and in fact, um, it, there is overwhelming research that shows that the vast, vast majority of mental health and behavioral health calls are people in crises they're, they're, and then who are not committing crimes and who are not violent. And, um, but because they're in crises, they may not be able to contain themselves physically. Whereas, um, and with, with a police response, they want the person to be contained and to, you know, act in control of themselves and to follow, follow orders. Um, and one of, the, uh, one of the reasons for escalating police violence uh, or force, the, the use of force in a police call is non-compliance. And, and, I, and, I, and I've been using the example of, imagine if you um, had to call the police, um, just as um, Renee was saying, that you had to call the police to get transport to a hospital if you, your child was having an asthma attack or a family member was having an asthma attack and the police got there and said, you know, start breathing right, stop breathe, stop acting like that. And of course they can't. And so they end up in jail or worse because they are not being compliant with a farcical and unreasonable um, command. Um, and so I think that what is really the lesson learned is that we really have to make sure that people understand that this is health. We're talking about healthcare. We're, and people, people, I've recently started saying to people when they say, well, what mental health versus physical health. And I say, there is no mental health without physical. If mental health is physical health, our brains are located inside our bodies. <laughs> They're not floating someplace else. So everything that comes out of our mind is a product of our physical self. Um, and so these are conversations that, you know, changing the conversation I think is really important. And then like with the work that Senator Peters is, is doing on like really expanding what people think of as public safety, I think is extremely important. Um, and, and, and the other thing that I think lessons learned is, um, that, that it really has to, um, like the Senator was saying, you know, understanding the roll call, that's something that I've been, that I've been learning about that I didn't, did not understand as much when I first started, started my job. Thank you, Cheryl. Senator Peters. Yeah, I mean, I sure really covered actually a good period of that time. So, I mean, I think I'll just add on to this that um, this is a landmark and historic accomplishment built on years of organizing, um, built on uh, transitioning from not just movement or, or community organizing and power to governing power, but uh, there was a lot of historical accomplishments in the state, including CESA. And in response to that, I think for many of us who do this organizing, we need to be prepared that the reactionary response back in 2022 is going to be something I don't think we've, we've actually have ever seen since the 90s. And they're going to want to undo the work that we've done. And so it is important that um, we think about our tactics as always evolving um, as we head into 2022. 
Um, I cannot stress enough how similar the response to Black Lives Matter has been to the point where it reminds me of the 90s, uh, of that tough on crime, crime bill of, of the 90s. And I think that particularly if you're a city focused person, um, you may not see it as much, but if you see the suburbs and downstate, you can see it very strongly. And so I think if the last seven years have shown me anything, it is that um, we can build an immense amount of power to take advantage of an opportunity, right? Out of that struggle and trauma that happened in 2020, the way I describe it is that it was a new hope. But 2021 and maybe 2022 can maybe be described as the empire strikes back. And so, yes, we we have we hit a period of crisis, that, you know, with a, a whole host of trauma. And because of the work that we did, it helped us be able to accomplish something truly transformative. But all of that can be undone uh, by reaction. And so um, I think that it is now incumbent on us to take our organizing to another level because we had, we've barely scratched the surface of transformative change, right? There's so much more that needs to happen, but even that is considered too much for so many people. And because of that, we need to understand that we need to keep creating the space to build and organize and create change. And we need to be ready to take our work to that next level, take implementation to the next level, um, to understand um, that the bases that we build need to be larger. Um, they need to be more diverse on a regional level. Um, we are entering a new phase of, of what I would say is a post-2020 movement experience. Um, and uh, so I think there's valuable lessons in the work that we've done. And I think there's about to be some very valuable lessons in the work that's coming. This is Emily Blum speaking, and I took myself off mute because I'm going to um, be facilitating uh, the audience Q&A. But Senator Peters, it's an amazing message to impart on this audience because um, this is exactly, uh, these are the, exactly the kinds of folks who um, want to take up that, uh, that challenge. So uh, question one, and you know, I think this could be for any of you, and Candace, I saw that you took yourself off camera, but you are certainly uh, included in these questions. Um, but it, you know, when we talk about mental health justice, that requires mental health practitioners. Um, so what can we do about the shortage of practitioners and the lack of cultural competency of mental health practitioners in black and brown communities? I, oh, go ahead. Well, I actually, I, I, can, I can answer um, this here. Uh, and uh, this is uh, Senator Peters. Um, so, in the Black Caucus Pillars, um, we did institute, in terms of the healthcare field, a direct um, uh, um, goal, so like in law, around equity um, and around making sure that uh, and, and inclusion, and particularly those who are in the workforce development space. So that you are getting the um, that there is proper training, uh, there's relationship building that's happening. Now there's a whole bunch of stuff like I always say there's an implementation side to things, and these things take time. So that exists, and then we did create, which I just got an email about actually, an anti-racism commission to specifically look at uh, healthcare broadly when it comes to um, racism and prejudice. Um, so my hope is that with those very intentional pieces of law, uh, especially in areas of Medicaid, because we have a little bit more uh, uh, power when it comes to Medicaid, um, that we're able to start um, training folks and building relationships with, with folks in the workforce, in the mental health workforce space uh, when it comes to race and, and gender. Um, now, so that's on that front. 
in terms of um, having to expand in the workforce side of things, um, you know, we're constantly trying to put investment in there. I think that uh, I will say Illinois is relatively competitive compared to neighboring states uh, and lends itself to being, um, now I can't, I'm not going to speak for Chicago specifically, that's sometimes its own complications, but Illinois is a relatively competitive state in terms of um, recruitment. And so with the investments that are coming in from 988, with the investments that are going into uh, mental health, with the governor who's made it clear to make those investments, that we can make it um, somewhat competitive. And I believe in Candace, you, you should correct me if I'm wrong, there is flexibility in CESA around uh, the mental health first responder. It's not a very strict definition uh, in terms of being able to respond uh, to a crisis, right? I believe there's a delineation between behavioral health and, and other healthcare needs, right? Yeah, there, there's not a, a strict guideline, but I do wanna say um, for us to pinpoint very specific processes and various things, that's why it's really important to get involved in the coalition now so that we can st set those standards because as you know, Senator Peters, we have to do those statewide committees and we want experts who understand how these operate and flow so that we can create those guidelines to get the people that we want to do the service. And, and, and I would like to add that one of the things is that we have to start thinking of these um, prof professionals in the same way that we think of any other public safety um, professionals. We, we, don't, we do not outsource police. We do not outsource fire. You know, there's all of these things that we don't outsource, but we do outsource this um, we do outsource healthcare, and in in the within the city, one of the reasons um, that we push for um, the public um, space one is because we we absolutely believe that it's important to rebuild the public infrastructure that benefits all of us, and also those are good paying jobs. Those are union jobs. Those are jobs that you can sustain yourself and, and have a family. And um, on, whereas, you know, within the nonprofit sector, the pay scale is much lower and it's not sustainable. So people, once they get enough of their hours and credentialing, then they do move into um, private practice. Um, so I think that's another reason why we really have to start thinking about this is how, do, how are we building up the public? infrastructure, I'm, my focus and thinking on it is in the city, but I think that statewide, that, that is, that's a very important question. This is Emily Blum speaking again. We got a number of questions around um, mental health practitioners. Uh, and so this is definitely a conversation that we would like to continue. Um, join us at the collab. This is another plug for disabilitylead.org backslash collab because this is the type of conversation that we that we, we definitely want to continue. Um, uh, you know, I think CESA is just a, this unbelievable example of ways in which people and groups got out of their specific silos so that they could get something done. Um, you know, we are so much more, this is a question that we received in advance. We are so much more effective in changing public policies and perceptions when we work on areas of shared interest together. How can we get more people to see that? Um, so CESA, um, the CESA coalition actually meets um, Thursdays. Uh, from five to six thirty, and I, I bring this up is because in order to affect <laughs> policy change and to continue to do the work that we want to see for this legislation to actually achieve, um, we need to sit down at the table with everyone who's involved in this system. 
Um, for me, um, as an organizer, every time I go to a meeting with a stakeholder that represents certain parts of this system, I have to then meet with another set after that meeting because there are just so many decisions that need to be made in this process. Um, and every time we think we have a grasp on, is it the union? Is it the entity? Is it the people we have? Is it the vendor? Like there are various levels to this. And so to get involved um, at the ground uh, with that expertise, because again, this is led by the people and we're looking at an institution that has been placed for many, many years. And so to change that, it requires many conversations. Um, and that is how we're able to change policy. Um, at Access Living, we were fortunate to not only have AYLP um, who represent folks with lived experience and were able to pull other folks in, but as Access Living as an organization, we were able to collaborate with our top level management and our lobbyists um, and other stakeholders and then in the community um, we're actually building a resource list of organizations who are doing services that the people actually like and support. Because um, again, our, our information is fragmented. And so who do we turn to for those ex for that expertise um, to do this work? And Senator Peters, you know, being in Springfield, we're going to have to go back um, down to Springfield to continue to push um, for this legisla legislation to um, be implement, implemented all the way through. And so we're, we're gonna need various uh, skill sets um, to make sure that things like this and other things, I really believe that SESA is gonna be a launching point for other legislation and other policies um, to be put in place as well um, to make sure that uh, this infrastructure that we're building um, could work for everyone. So I just wanna make sure I uh, say that. This is Emily speaking, and I'm gonna actually start my video because unfortunately that's all the time we have for this afternoon. I feel like this conversation uh, could go on for much, much longer, um, and it can actually. Um, so first and foremost, uh, thank you, Senator Peters, uh, Cheryl, Candace, Renee, uh, for, for joining us this afternoon for your incredible work. Um, we, we thank you so much. Um, if you found value from this conversation, uh, join the collab. It's, it's our intentional community space to learn with and from one another and support a collective vision toward racial equity and disability justice. Um, I know that this conversation will continue. Um, join our network of positive disruptors. If you are a person with a disability living in the Chicago region and are interested in joining our community, visit disabilitylead.org backslash apply to become a member or fellow applications will open in mid 2022 for our 2023 Institute. This recording will be um, uh, uh, published on our blog if you'd like to revisit it. Um, I think I mentioned at the top of the program that uh, Spanish translation uh, was going to be available. Um, we weren't able to connect with our translator in time, so um, that those Spanish translations will be added um, post-event and we'll make those available to you all. Um, if you would like to continue to see Disability Lead produce accessible events like these, please consider contributing to our program at disabilitylead.org backslash donate. And finally, please stay engaged with us. Follow us on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn to learn about our work and make sure you don't miss events like today's. So that's it from us. Thank you and have a wonderful evening. <laughs>